Alright, what's up everybody and welcome to episode number four zero of Uncovering Unexplained the Mysteries. Big four oh. Wow, we turned 40 for uh, Wednesday, actually for a change, Wednesday, March uh, 29th, we're just about to yep. April. Yeah, dude. Uh, Almost April Fools. New Year's. Wh- wh- where are you guys at on your New Year's uh, resolutions? Where you at? Where you at on that? Where's the New Year, New Me thing? Are you new? Are you a different, different person? I don't. No, you're not. And like, and like I said, I even I, I made a crack about the New Year's resolution thing uh, on my Facebook page, and I was like, New Year, same me. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty. It's exactly what it's gonna be. I mean, there might be a few new things I might try to do and might hopefully do, but. And your yeah. main Mike's mainly referring to drugs. <laughs> new things that you're gonna try. No. Nah. Oh, listen to that silence. Wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised at. Uh, well, I mean, it's like I've done a lot this year. Um, I you know moved blah blah blah. I said all that shit. Um, but creatively, it, this year has uh, it's kind of sucked for me. Yeah, 2017 that is. Uh, my channel has seen the least amount of activity. Uh, YouTube.com slash Dancing with Ghosts. Uh, it's seen the uh, the smallest amount of activity that it has in the whole almost more than two years that I've done the channel, and that's just simply because of my schedule, and it really sucks. But Hey, you know, God, it's not like you have to be a certain age limit to make it in yeah, the YouTube world. You're so. making more money, though. So, I mean, look at it from that perspective. You're yeah, making... but it's not creatively satisfying like making YouTube content is or making music and stuff. So, I wish it could. I yeah. Wish I could be. I wish I could have said, oh, yeah, I've done all this creative stuff in 2017. Aside from the podcast, of course, but it's like I haven't. So, I feel that tugging on my uh, sack a little bit. But besides that, um,. You know, it's it's been a pretty uh pretty good year living in my own place and all that stuff's been really good. How have you been, Mike? I've been doing all right. Um just waiting to get everything situated with uh, uh WC Vancouver. I got accepted, I'm working with financial aid. Probably won't do summer term, so I'll go I'll start in the fall. And in the meantime trying to find a way to, you know, get more money. So hustling. Hustling on the streets. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we have a Facebook group. I'll go ahead and mention that out of the gate. Well, first of all, we have a Facebook fan page. If you like this podcast, you should go like us. It's facebook.com slash Uncovering Unexplained Mysteries. And then we have a Facebook group of the same name, uh, Uncovering Unexplained Mysteries. I'm getting a sneaking suspicion that that group is filling up with people who have no idea about this podcast. Um... I think there's just some people who just like unsolved mysteries, and you know that's fine. I mean, fine with me. Uh, I don't think there is a private group for people or fans on unsolved mysteries. There's other groups that you can join, but they're not private. So you have to deal with all of the really lame setups that some of the non-private groups have. So yeah. Um, I'm okay with this. As long as people are kind and courteous and nice about it, I don't really have an issue. The more the merrier. Well, we recently, well, Mike recently posted a thing of like, how can we improve our brand? You know, like companies always do that shit. And it's really something you have to do when you get to the point to where people actually start paying attention and and giving a shit about the kind of stuff you're putting out and you start getting kind of followers. You know, you kind of do that. You get people paying on your Patreon Patreon. accounts. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, I always hated that. You know, I, my personal take was always like, fuck all that. I'm going to do what I want to do. And if you don't like it, whatever. But I mean, you kind of get a certain amount of responsibility that you kind of owe to people after a while because they put in their time to you. So you got to, got to give back. So uh, part of that will be us doing a fan Q&A at the end of the podcast. Uh, too late for you to post anything by the time you're listening to this, but hopefully you saw my post earlier on the group, um, so on and so forth. Uh, so without further ado, uh, the first segment was one that uh, a picture that I actually posted onto that Facebook group of um, Patricia Meehan taking an old-fashioned selfie with like one of those cam- Canon, the old-school Canon cameras or Fuji film or whatever the fuck brand it was or whatever but uh mike thought it would be a good segment to actually cover so uh he picked that one that's the first one we'll be talking about 
Yeah, so the case details are as follows. On April 20th, 1989, on a dark country road near Circle, Montana, a woman driving on the wrong side of the road almost hit a car head on. Another driver, Carol Heights, witnessed the near miss and then was hit by the same car. Carol emerged from the wreckage dazed but not seriously injured. Then a woman appeared out of the darkness. Carol realized it was the woman who hit her. She just stared. She never said anything. She just stared at me. I will never forget her. Right from the beginning, I always thought this uh, segment was great, even when I first saw it, because it really grabs you with this opening that's very mysterious, and it's very surreal and strange. You're just like, okay, you got an accident that happens right out of nowhere, and then it also is an amnesia case. Yeah, for sure. The driver of the first car, Peggy Bueller. 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 <laughs> Returned to help and saw the silent woman. As I looked out across the accident, I noticed someone on the other side of the fence, standing there like a spectator, not like it had happened to her. The silent woman walked away from the accident scene and then vanished into the night. Police traced the car to its owner, 38-year-old Patricia Meehan, and began to search for her. Over the next five days, they looked on land and from the air, but they found no trace of Patricia. There were no th there were two theories no theories there were no theories on how to so let's the not area. talk about it any further <laughs> good night everybody see you later bum, bum, ba -da. <laughs> I can just imagine that there were no theories on yes, how she that, left the area that was the Price is Right theme that I was just humming there I'm glad they haven't right. changed that theme after like forty years they still have it. Drew Carey's a good there were too. there were actual theories. Okay, there were two theories as to how Patricia left the area. She may have stowed away in a hay truck that was seen about a half a mile from the accident, or she simply hitched a ride. At least 100 people have reported seeing Patricia Meehan since she vanished. Patricia has made no attempt to contact contact her family or friends. Authorities believe she may be suffering from amnesia. Just before the accident, those who knew her well, including her mother Dolly Meehan, noticed that Patricia seemed depressed and withdrawn. She was, I guess, taking in her own life and what she had accomplished, and I think she missed having children because I think she re realized she really loved them. And after Patricia disappeared, her family found a roll of undeveloped film still on her camera. It contained a haunting self-portrait. And I, I love that, I love that, could be, you know, because this, obviously, this is so before, like, social media and cell phone cameras yeah. and all that stuff. I love how, like, it's, like, it, it's, I like it on so many levels, but on one of the levels I like it because it's, like, human beings have always been into portraits themselves or looking at themselves. I mean, they, we act like this yeah, is a new thing. Yeah, back then, that was a pretty strange occurrence. I mean, to take a photo like that. What, it wasn't like nowadays that there's cell phones, like just easy click of the, oh, duck face or whatever. I mean, here, it, it was pretty bizarre for someone to do that. But it was so cool, though, because like literally that yeah. same exact kind of thing would happen, would start proliferating 20 years later with teenage girls in their bathrooms yeah. pointing a cell phone at the mirror. And here she was kind of doing that. So that's why I posted the picture on the group. And if yeah. you want to see the picture, you can go and check out on the group or whatever. But yeah, I, I don't know. I just, to me, that was really cool. And I love how Unsolved Mysteries, you know, because of course the word selfie didn't exist back then. Thank God. No. What a better time to be alive <laughs> than you now. Can you imagine um, Robert Stack saying it contained a selfie? A selfie. I love that they call it a, a <laughs> self-portrait. They might as well have called it a self-portrayal of herself. You know, just make it as long and clinical as possible. You know, just, I, but I, I, I really liked that though, and it was like undeveloped film, so it was like even creepier. You know, because it was still in the camera and all that. I like. Yeah. So psychologist Don Laplante so speculated on Patricia's mental health. It appears that Patricia was experiencing a very difficult time in her life and was involved in a rather dramatic accident, which may have involved a head injury. The combination of these factors may have caused amnesia. She does not know who she is, has lost memories of the past, and is out searching for herself throughout the country. That's just so sad to me. It really is. Can you imagine that? I, I, just losing your memory and just wandering around trying to search for some shred of who you are. What I can't get over is just how often this fucking happens on, uh, like, 
Well, not only on the show, but obviously in real life too. And but the yeah, show I mean, we've covered some it. other amnesia cases before as well, or we briefly mentioned amnesia. But yeah, I mean, there are there was so many of these cases that Unsolved Mysteries actually had a special subcategory. Yeah, yeah, on the show called amnesia. So anytime someone yeah. like I've learned like from from my many hundreds of segments I've watched on Unsolved Mysteries. I've learned that if someone starts acting weird, it's either schizophrenia or amnesia. It's one of the, it's one of the two, um, or or there's a rare third one where they legitimately are involved in some kind of like clandestine operation, like yeah. the CIA, whatever. So Patricia was spotted dozens of times between Montana and Seattle, mainly at truck stops. But in every case, she had hitchhiked out of the area by the time the authorities had arrived. Waitress Barb Ruff confirmed one sighting of Patricia in Bozeman, Montana, in May of 1989, just a few miles from her home. Patty came in the, into the door and wanted to be sat quickly and served quickly. She told me, I'm in a hurry. And I said, well, we do breakfast in 10 minutes. You'll be out very quickly. And then I said to her, you must have to be back to work at 9? And it was about 8.30, and she said, no, I'm just going shopping. I couldn't understand why it was so important for her to be there right at nine o'clock to go shopping. She was she was in such a huge hurry. Now, I mean, nowadays I can understand if it's some kind of big sale or something at nine o'clock. Well, first uh, of all, my whole thing is is if you if I'm a, a waiter or a waitress in another world, if I was born Joshina, <laughs> um, and someone comes in and they say and they say I'm in a hurry. Okay, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is this old saying. I saw it in a tattoo shop one time. It said, poor planning on your part doesn't necessarily constitute an emergency on mine. And <laughs> like that's like the first like <laughs> phrase that comes into my head. So it's like, I'm in a hurry. It's like, okay, well, that sounds like your problem. And, you know, this is a restaurant. So, you know, I'm not going to say I'm going to drag my ass on purpose. But, you know, it's... If you're in a hurry, maybe go go to fa a fast food chain or something. I don't know. Like to me, instantly I would be like rude, you know, a little bit. Like if someone came in saying that, like I'm in a hurry, you know, like well, fuck off then, you know, like <laughs> you come to the wrong place there, Sonny. But thankfully, yeah, I'm not a waiter, so uh, you know, thankfully that's not the career I went into because obviously I wouldn't handle the situation very well. I feel the same way about that kind of thing. I mean, if you're in, in I, I've dealt with that before when I worked at the movie theater, people trying to rush me and everything. And, you know, and it's always the type of individual or individuals who are honestly being assholes who act like that. So here, though, I, I don't know if that was the case. I, I, you know, she was probably in her own head and for some reason was like, I need to be going somewhere. I need to need to go. Another waitress, Brenda Clements, also noticed that Patricia was acting strangely. What stood out in my mind was that she seemed really disorientated and really spacey. I heard her talking to herself, and she sat at that table for an hour and a half just looking out the window, tr watching people walk by. And that's when I walked up to her and asked her, you okay? And I was wondering if there was anything I could do because she seemed so lost. I felt like she didn't know where she was or who she was. Although years have passed and no word from Patricia, her father and the rest of her family still hold out hope that she may one day find her way home. More than anything else in the world, I want her back with us. And we would then know that she was she was safe. Not knowing who she is taking a ride from, that's my biggest worry. I just pray day in, day out that she's still with some good people. Yeah, and according to um, the, because you know you can see you can go and watch this on Amazon Prime. It's I believe it's on uh, season two. Um, the, uh, according to uh, the uh, update that they have on all this, or almost all the segments, they don't have updates on all of them. But um, on this one, she has never been found. Well, there actually there's a little extra thing here on the Wikia. That says, in 2011, police released a composite of a woman found in British Columbia who web sleuth bloggers recognized her as possibly being Patricia. One of the bloggers sent the tip to the police, but it was later revealed that it was not her. Yeah, so, I mean, the fact that she still isn't found, um, you could probably assume that she's dead. But you, they, there's no body that's been identified. Yeah, no. There's no guarantee. So, I mean, she could still be alive, but just as has amnesia, doesn't know who she is. 
could have already went on to live a different life without even really remembering her previous one. Oh man, we got to cover that one about that one guy who got amnesia yeah. and like yeah. remarried and yeah, dude. Uh -huh. How have we forgotten that one? That's a great one. <laughs> that was a two-parter. Two-parter there, according to VHS rips anyway. Um <laughs> I don't know if I should be mentioning those or not. Whatever. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's pretty much the whole case, right? I mean. Yeah, that's pretty much the whole case. It was short, but I, I, I thought it was interesting with the whole amnesia aspect. Um, I, I feel for her parents a lot because I, I, I can't, you know, that, that's that got to hurt. I mean, losing your, your uh, kid to murder or an accident or whatever you know, that's equally as bad, but at the same time, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine the stress and the grief that you would deal with knowing that, well, I haven't, she's not technically dead, she just doesn't know who she is, and we have no way of finding her or locating her or getting her to remember who she is yeah you know, oftentimes in situations like these it seems like death almost comes as a reassurance to the family because at least they know you know that that they can close the the book on that you know and they don't have to worry anymore they know what happened I, you know a lot of these crime shows i watch that seems to be a common thing with the families they're like you know at least we know where she is i guess meaning you know at a cemetery rather than you know what happened where is she you know kind of thing as what would be happening in a case like this where you know they're just literally you're yeah i don't i wouldn't even want to think about that i mean your thoughts just run rampant about what could be. i mean i don't have any like kids or anything close to that so like the only example i'm thinking that came to my head is like what if my brother went missing and he was just out in the wild and i don't know what happened to him and that's not even that great of an example because, you know, your kid's going to be probably closer to you than a brother, maybe. I don't know. Me and my brother aren't super close. He li he kind of listens to this podcast every now and then, so I don't want to, like, say too <laughs> 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 like, I don't know how I dug myself into this hole. He's going to say something to me next time he sees me. Oh, we're not super close. Thanks, dick. Um, but, yeah, that, that's got to be a horrible experience for a parent, though, especially. Um so, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's like, I'm, I'm like a single guy in my late 20s. I live on my own. If I go missing, it's kind of like, you know, very few people are going to be upset about that. I'm not trying to be like emo, like, oh, nobody likes me. But I'm just saying like the, the facts of the situation, you know, I'm not like, uh, you know. Well, I know I would be worried sick about you. Oh, uh, and I know like... there'd be other, other people, you know, who listen to the podcast who would be worried about what, where you are. Well, thanks, guys. You made me feel wanted. But I'm just saying, like, I'm not like, uh, you know, uh, Miss Beauty Pageant. Uh, I I'm not John Benet Ramsey. You know, you're not it's, it's, Tammy. Lynn, you're not Tammy Lynn Leper. Yeah, it's not gonna be headline news. It's like uh, on this day of news, a single twenty-something uh, <laughs> white guy went missing. Who gives a fuck? On to our next topic. <laughs> you know, On like, to our next uh, topic about celebrity news. Yeah, yeah. I, you know. So I mean, yeah, it, it wouldn't be like a John Benet Ramsey case. It wouldn't be a Tammy Leppert case. You know, it. it, it you know. But, That's so, one I'm surprised they didn't cover on the show. I guess they just when did it happen? That, yeah, it happened while the show was on, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's a couple that I'm surprised that they didn't cover on there. Um, I mean, the John Benet Ramsey case is something we could always talk about if anybody wants. Us there's to a talk there's about. a question on on uh, the Q and A that relates to that though, so save it for later. Oh, uh, see, I haven't even read the Q and A because I'm trying to go in cold and be surprised. Well, like, a birthday cake. It's a good thing that I did that, so that you're not. Like, oh, this one, this one, this one. Oh, I already answered it. Oh, whoops. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I know the uh, mom, I know the mom's died. She's she died of cancer. John Benet's mom. Yeah. yeah. This is this is getting rather depressing, isn't it? <laughs> oh, this is uh, Mike. This is the typical tone of all of our podcasts. Why are you acting like this is any different? I mean, that's why uh, my jackassery, I guess, is so welcome because it adds a bit of levity to uh, these situations. The next one, next one uh, we're going to cover doesn't deal with any uh, murders or rapes or anything like that. This is this my is wheelhouse. Back to, 
Back to good old fashioned unexplained cryptozoology. cryptozoology. This time it's the other uh, water monster. Uh, there are other water monsters out there other than Loch the Loch Ness monster. Uh, this is one of the more well known ones. There's a few others like the Ogopogo, but the Ogopogo, honestly, uh, it's not really that I mean, great of a segment. That segment can honestly bounce away on a pogo stick for all I'm concerned because there really <laughs> isn't that much there to that one. It's a beaver. <laughs> it's clearly a beaver. Winona's got herself a big brown beaver, and she says off to all her friends, one day you know that beaver tried to leave her, so she chained up a cyclone fence. Anyway, that's a reference <laughs> for any Primus fans uh, out there. I, I just think of Angry Beavers, the show. Oh, that show sucks. A lot of people consider that show, like, retro Nickelodeon, and I guess it I is. Had, I had fun with that show. I, what are you I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I thought it was... I, th I thought it, on, on the, on the like, sliding scale of Nickelodeon cartoons, I thought that one was you know, kind of towards the shittier side. Uh, I never liked that one. I, I love a lot of retro Nick cartoons, like Rocco's Modern Life and Ah, Real Monsters and Rugrats, all that I stuff. guess maybe it's because I grew up with Angry Beavers, so that might be part I of it. I did, that. too. I did, too. I just didn't like it back then, and I don't like it now. Like, that's a, th that's a funny thing about, like, nostalgia and, like, all, you know, nostalgia. Well, really I tried watching now. Rugrats a while back, and that was kind of hard. Well, you didn't like so. Rugrats? I mean, I didn't hate it. It's just, I don't know. As an adult, it's not as entertaining. Well, yeah. I mean, none of that shit is as entertaining. Very well, little. Rocco, Rocco's Modern Life, I think, is just as entertaining as an adult because it actually does have a good amount of adult humor in it. Yeah, but the thing about, like, nostalgia culture now is, like, people, like, w want you to just like everything just for the sake of it being old. And, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't like as a kid that's considered, like, really well, cool and retro. Now. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> like Power Rangers. I didn't like Power Rangers as a kid, and I don't like I, it I now. I loved Power Rangers as a kid, okay. And I had the toys and everything, and I watched the movie again recently, and it's a guilty pleasure of mine. Turbo, Dude, though, it's not a even a guilty shit. pleasure. It's a, you can totally go out in the streets and be like, I love Power Rangers. And the like, movie, though, I, uh, Ivan Ooze and everything, yeah, that's a guilt. I'm I'm saying it's a guilty pleasure because at best it's average to me. It's a time waster. To me, a guilty pleasure is something that universally is panned by people and you like it. But but Power Rangers is hip. It's in, you know, like... Oh, yeah, well, eh, kind of in certain circles. I mean, some people... Honestly, Power Rangers is a pretty nerdy thing. I mean, even more than Ninja Turtles, for instance. So... Yeah, there are some there are some people who grew up in Ninja Turtles and also like Power Rangers and, other, and vice versa. But at the same time, Power Rangers, especially lately, has been more of a niche thing. And even with this reboot, which I'm dreading seeing because I'm hearing all these things about it, just doesn't make me really excited to see it. Oh, Krispy Kreme donut advertising, bull cum jokes, politically correct Power Rangers, Billy's autistic, Trina's a lesbian. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I wasn't ready for all that. I needed to prepare myself a little bit more. Oh, man, that's <laughs> something. So, yeah, and then like an hour or so of character building, and then the last 30 minutes or so of the movies when they finally get in any sort of action or morph all or I do gave, anything. All I gave a fuck about on Power Rangers was the Japanese uh, side of it, the actual uh, original well, show. Well, I, mean, yeah, I mean, that's the best part of it. Yeah, is, that's the best is part. The, the stock footage stock, uh, yeah. from Sentai. Yeah. Uh, from, from Super Sentai, but... The Save by the uh, Bell part, you know, the American shot stuff, I could give a fuck less about that yeah it's it's pretty cringe cringe inducing i i watched uh, a few episodes on netflix recently and and i can watch it as like a just for for the power rangers stuff when they morph and things like that yeah that's but the cool. stuff with their in the regular four you know when they're just teenagers uh, it, it it's pretty bad i mean it makes saved by the bell look like a masterpiece in comparison <laughs> okay but so we're, anyway, we're officially um, alienating well, everybody right now well, <laughs> well, whatever. I mean, it actually does tie, you know, Power Rangers has giant monsters in it. That's true. So it ties into uh, the next case of Champ. Now, Champ is the name of a mysterious creature of large size said to live in Lake Champlain between Vermont and New York. It's pronounced it's Champlain. Oh, Champlain. I just interrupted Mark. Mike. Ha! 
<laughs> a little, little inside joke there for the group. Wink. Uh, uh, so uh, it says they live in Lake Champlain between Vermont and New York. Its existence dates back to the time when Native Americans lived in the area, but over the years, the creature has become a lot more than a creature of legend, but something of an American version of Nessie. There have been hundreds of reported sightings since explorer Samuel Ch Champlain first described the creature in his exploration of the lake. Champ gained enormous popularity in July of 1977 after getting photographed by Sandra Monsey. She had grown up near Lake Champlain, and her grandfather teased her with tales of Champ, a legendary sea creature. In 1977, Sandra, her two children, and her fiancé, Tony, were on vacation near Lake Champlain when they noticed a disturbance on the lake. So Sandra says, So we stopped at this one place and moved down over a bank. Tony, her husband, decided to go back to the car because he hadn't taken pictures of the children yet, and the children were in the water with you know their shoes off and whatever. And she goes, And I'm sitting there by myself, and I'm looking out by the lake. And the lake started churning. My thir first thought was scuba divers. But then it, it's too much. It's too big of a group of scuba divers. Then I thought a school of fish. And, you know, because there's a particular type of fish in that area. You there's know. a very large sturgeon and big walleyes in Champlain. Yeah. And then the head and neck came out of the water and then the back. And I watched it turn its head and back and move around. And at first its mouth was open and water came out of its mouth. And I'm feeling like I shouldn't be there. I feel like this is something I shouldn't be witnessing. I feel like this is something that should have been extinct 30 million years ago. But even then, I wasn't scared. And at that point, Tony came back and saw it, and he got all panicky, and he started screaming at the children to get out of the water, and we headed to the car. But then I turned around, and I took a picture. And that's when you get the legendary picture that she took. Yeah, which honestly is pretty impressive to me. That's, what, that's the... Uh sea creature uh picture that to me is the one that's the most impressive uh compared to the loch ness photo which has already been uh proven as a hoax she feared public ridicule though so she threw away the negatives but kept the picture and she kept that picture hidden for two years now that's, yeah. that's a little curious to me yeah it is why would you throw away the negatives yet keep the positive you know um yeah. Which, I mean, it could easily, it could, this could be another hoax as well. So, for all we know, on her deathbed or something, she could reveal that it's a hoax, like what happened with Loch Ness. But, um, she goes on to contact Joe Zarzinski, um, yeah, at, after some prodding from some friends, and yeah, an offer of a book about Champ. Uh, he sent the print to the University of Arizona to be analyzed by cryptozoologist Richard Greenwell. He comments, we digitized it, and we ran all sorts of computer enhancement techniques. We were looking for pulleys or ropes or anything like that, super impositions, but we found no evidence of hoaxing. We concluded that the object, whatever it was, or whatever it is, was there in the lake, and at that estimated distance. That was a very, there wasn't any was, sort of superimposition. That was a very William Roll-esque cadence you had there in your voice, Mike. I liked that. <laughs> well, thank you. The object in the Monsi photograph resembles a plesiosaur. Greenwell says, an aquatic reptile from the Cretaceous about 60 to 70 million years ago with long neck and, and flippers. It resembles that, but that's a long time to have survived. It really is. Um, I, I guess you can make an argument. Maybe there's something that happened. Ice age, maybe got frozen. And then when the ice melted, it somehow survived and is in this lake for all this time. But I mean, it, it, it's very... I mean, the problem with these sea monster type uh, theories, and, you know, the zo cryptozoology is that you have to really suspend a lot of your disbelief to believe that this monster lived, you know, creature lived for this long. You know? Well, <laughs> really I, honest. just for shits and giggles, I actually pulled up an article here about um, 10 animals we thought were extinct but aren't. Well, I, I know. I mean, the coasant, that's the first one that would pop up. I mean, I... I, I you know, I, I was going to bring that up. I mean, you have the Colossanth. Uh, I don't even know if I said that. Oh, oh, it's a Sea Sorry. Thank you. 
uh, website. I just figured this it, it might be cool to just run through a few of these an creatures. Well, I mean, you, the Coelocomp, uh, this is perhaps the best known of the, all the formerly extinct creatures. We thought the objectively terrifying Coelocomp went extinct 65 million years ago until a South African museum curator discovered a specimen on a fishing trawler in 1938. There are two known species, one that lives off the coast of the eastern coast of Africa and one that lives off the coast of Indonesia. The fact that we know about them at all is kind of amazing. They are not easy to find. They can live up to 2,300 feet below the water Jesus. surface. Yeah. Uh, they are, however, pretty huge, like as big as a person. Jesus. They can grow up to six and a half feet and weigh almost 200 pounds. Jesus. Some scientists think coelocomps represent an evolutionary step between sea and land animals and this is one ugly fucking fish bro if you saw that underwater you'd be like oh get away from me like this thing is yeah. freaky it is ugly it's nasty looking it looks like it looks like more of an evolution like a fish evolving into a tree stump that looks like <laughs> it looks like the missing link between that uh we need a, a proof that uh fish evolved into tree stumps and this would be the thing it looks like the cross between a tree stump and a fish um another yeah. Another um, creature that we thought was extinct but isn't is a uh, Gracilidris. Uh, it, it looks like an ant, basically. These little guys were only discovered alive in 2006, so not much is known. This nocturnal genus of ant was thought to have died out between 15 and 20 million years ago. A species of Gracilidris has been found in Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil and lives in small underground colonies. Then we have a giant Paulus earthworm. This albino microinvertebrate is found in eastern Washington state and part of Idaho, Ooh, which is why it is also called the Washington giant earthworm. We thought it was extinct in the 1980s, but recently that's been proven false. Two specimens were recovered in 2010. Prior to that, the most recent sighting was 2005. There have been reports that this worm can get up to three feet long, oh, but Jesus. nothing confirmed. The most common length is probably about a foot. But holy cow, more, I'm more like, holy shit, a foot-long earthworm? <laughs> now, I've got to tell this this short story here real quick. Um, now, I don't know if anybody knows this about me if I mentioned on a previous podcast. Uh, I grew up in a Christian school. Uh, and when I say grew up, I mean I was in there. That's from, why you're so messed up. Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, I was there from fifth grade all the way until 12th grade. And we would go to chapel every Thursday, which was basically uh, school forced uh, church. We went there for an hour, however long. Then we'd have like these missions conferences and youth conferences and all sort of stuff. So during one of these times, there was a speaker that came in, and he was saying that in Russia, they had basically found hell, and it was in the center of the earth, and these people had dug and dug and dug and dug, and as they started getting closer to the center of the earth, and, you know, of course, this all sounds like bullshit now, but at the time, I'm like, oh, man, that is so freaky and gives so much more credence to what they're talking about. They said that they started recording, like, what sounded like screams of pain and anguish as they were getting to the center of the earth, and they were also encountering these huge worms that were much bigger than what we would normally see, much like these giant palus earthworm things or whatever so hearing you say that reminded me of that story and it reminded me to remind myself that that was a bullshit story it uh, is a bullshit story because they did find some hole or whatever but um there were no screams recorded or anything like that um that's essentially a creepypasta if i remember correctly or definitely a hoax or an urban legend I think even uh, Snopes actually debunks that, if I remember correctly. Now, here's 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 a creature. Uh, this one, you can take this one. This one has got a name that definitely sounds pretty freaky. This is a terror skink. One. <laughs> I mean, really, the terror skink. Now, now, this could either be a an animal that we thought was extinct but wasn't, or this could be be the title to like a Dokken album in the uh, 1980s like or uh, an awful uh, dr uh, direct to video or uh, direct to sci-fi channel monster movie so, starring Steve Gutenberg yeah exactly so uh, one of the best common names in the animal kingdom 
Uh, this rare reptile was thought to be extinct until 2003. And no wonder. It's only found in the Isle of Pines. Before being photographed, filmed, and released by specialists at the French National Museum of Natural History, the skink was only known by one specimen. Then we have the Nelson. <laughs> the <laughs> Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> The name of this tiny shrew may be weirdly anthropomorphized, but for the past century or so, it hasn't been too keen on making itself known. The little guys were discovered in 1894 and weren't seen again for 109 years. That is until two scientists decided to look for them. These four-inch-long creatures were rediscovered on the slopes of the San Martin Tuxta volcano in Mexico. I do encourage you to browse some photos. It's a pretty adorable animal. It looks like a turtle. That's an adorable name for a turtle, the Nelson. Well, that's actually the Ar Arakan Forest Turtle. Never but... mind, I'm an idiot and I can't read. The Arakan Forest Turtle. Prior to its rediscovery in 1994, uh, the Arakan Forest Turtle had been last seen in 1908. In a way, it's not surprising. They stay hidden for so long. They like to hide in forest floor debris in western Myanmar, but they couldn't hide forever. And in 1994, a couple of specimens turned up in Asian food markets. Despite being critically endangered, the Arakan Forest Turtle is still traded by pet dealers. That's not cool. Fucking assholes. <laughs> the, Java, the Javan Elephant. The story of how this comparatively small elephant is, is, has become de-extinct is pretty cool. Scientists thought that the Javan Elephant went extinct not long after Europeans came to Southeast Asia. However, it looks like a ceremonial elephant trade centuries ago saved the Javan Elephant from the fate of the dodo. Locals believe that the Sultan of Sulu, which is now a part of the Philippines, transplanted elephants from Java to Borneo, which wouldn't have been uncommon at the time. In 2003, a study concluded that the Borneo pygmy elephant are genetically distinct from other Asian elephants and likely originated on Java. This seems to be one instance when the trade of animals may have actually saved the species from extinction. So it's like a tiny elephant. Yeah. For some reason, as you were reading the description, just the lyrics to Iron Maiden's Run to the Hills came to my head. The white man came across the sea. He brought us pain and misery. He killed our tribes, killed our <laughs> creed. He took our game for his own need. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Run to the hills. Run to the hills. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how those guys sang like that back in the 80s and made it sound cool, because whenever I try to do it... Yeah, I just sound like I got kicked in the balls whenever I do it, but they they, they sounded pretty cool. <laughs> they, yeah. They sounded pretty cool. <laughs> they, they, they kicked ass. <laughs> Shut up, Beavoth. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Anyway, up next we have Lord Howe Island Stick Insect. Okay. What a name. All right. I don't feel like reading that. So let's go to the... What, the giant terrifying insect is also known as the tree lobster, which means it wins for best common name in the animal kingdom. Sorry, Terror Skank. And do they ever have a har harrowing story of survival? Tree lobsters used to be widely common on Lord Howe Island off the coast of New South Wales. Like, you couldn't go anywhere without bumping, it, bumping into one. But this all changed in the 1880s and the first two decades of the 1900s when mice and rats, respectively, were inter introduced to the island. By 1920, you couldn't find a tree lobster if you tried. First off, tree lobster is, is a funny name. Like, Do they taste like lobster, too? Probably not. And by 1960, they were considered extinct. However, you can't keep a good insect down. There were rumors of a tree lobster population on the nearby island of Bowie's Pyramid, which is basically just a sheer cliff jutting out of the ocean. In 2001, a team of intrepid scientists decided to brave the cliffs to try to prove that the insect was indeed extinct. Boy, were they wrong. Instead, they found a population of 24 tree lobsters. It's thought that they floated to the island as, as discarded bait or were carried by birds. However, they got there, they survived. And there were efforts underway to reintroduce them to their natural habitat. And then have them die later, probably, by doing so. <laughs> <laughs> there was some picture um, that I found on the internet. It was like some rare shell or some rare uh, crustacean uh, was recently found by uh, humans and then killed. Uh, I think it was something like that. <laughs> and it was just so, like, sums up... It was found by humans and then it was boiled and then eaten. That just sums up, butter. like, us as a, a, as a human race. <laughs> like, found rare creature, then killed it. <laughs> like, that's, that's us. Um, 
Uh, all right, we're almost done here. The uh, next we have the Takai. This is one of those flightless birds native to New Zealand. Corin, can you uh, shine light on this? I'm from Australia. I'm not from New Zealand. They're two different places. That was a horrible accent. I just offended everybody in two countries. They were considered extinct in 1898 after four specimens were killed and mounted for museums. Gross, right? But never fear! In 1948, the bird was rediscovered near Lake whatever the fuck that name is. Even though Tiano. They're... Tiano, okay. Tiano. That's probably what it is. See, you actually attempt these pronunciations. I just skip them. Uh, even <laughs> though they were once abundant, they are now only a few hundred. And this looks like a... This looks like a rat. Pissed off bird. This looks like a bird that I don't want to get on its bad side. Man, I need to, I need to like, keep up with the pictures here that correspond to the actual descriptions. Because I'm, like, looking all in the wrong places. Yeah, this looks like a bird... You know, he's plump. He's got a nice coloration to him. You know, I actually saw a peacock for the first time in my life in person a few weeks ago. And it had its its huge peacock feathers out. Those are incredible creatures. Yeah, they are. Um, And I got up close to it. And it, dude, it's, it's fan that it had spread out was huge. It was ginormous. Yeah. It was like... You wouldn't believe a creature like that existed unless you saw it. You know, well, I mean, I guess most people would read about it and just assume it was real. But yeah. I don't know. For me, it was just like, wow, that's something you don't see every day. Like that, it was it was incredible to look yeah. at. No, Here's we, the last one on the list, which is definitely something you don't see every day: the Cuban solandon. Oof, this is kind of an ugly creature. But don't say that to its face. Its saliva is venomous. Ooh. So I guess it might be just as well that we've only managed to catch 37 specimens since its discovery in 1861. As you may guess from its name, it's native to Cuba. Uh, and by 1970, we thought this nocturnal burrowing animal was extinct since none, since none had been spotted in 80 years. That assumption was premature, however, because three specimens were captured from 1973 to 1974. The most recent find was in 2003 when one was captured named Alejandrito, studied and then released back into the wild. Now this thing looks like a rat combined. It's got the bill of a of a bird. Um, well, not really. It's got more of a long snout, like a shrew or something like that. It's very long. Uh, yeah. It's like almost like needle point long. Like it's yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. This thing is ugly, and it's venomous on top of that. Man, that's like pretty cool. If you could like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like whatever however these creatures are made it's like whatever force out there makes it higher power whatever you believe in it's yeah. like they customized like certain creatures like the fact that these animals these creatures these insects that were uh, deemed to be extinct actually did show up later shows that there's a chance you know to quote uh uh dumb and dumber you know so that means there's a chance yeah there's a small chance that there actually might be some plesiosaurs or whatever living in some of these lakes somewhere. Now, another idea is that champ might be as a, a, a Zeuglodon, whatever that was. I thought is. you were about to start doing some jazz scatting there, some zizazuzuzay. Or go, I'm the scat man. I'm the scat man. A very musical podcast this episode. I hope you guys um, get extremely annoyed by it. So that was my the other idea, the another idea is that Chant might be a Zigulodon, a snake-like whale extinct for 20 million years, or a lake sturgeon, which has been known to reach seven feet in length. Another a, f a further examination of the Manzi Ohoto is difficult since she lost the negatives. I mean Manzi Photo. Uh, Wikia, need an edit there. I don't think there is such a thing as an Ohoto. What the hell is an Ohoto? Man, you could tell me any of this stuff exists, and I'd be like, yeah, okay, that's probably true. <laughs> that's another word for photo, all right? It's it's it's, it's uh because I saw Manzi, so I thought, okay, is it like some Native American thing? <laughs> Uh, it's an Ohoto. Uh, the photo is difficult since she lost the negatives, but dozens of eyewitnesses have reported sightings of Champ. On July 7th, of 1988, Walter and Sandy Tappan and their daughter Heidi were out on Lake Champlain with a camcorder to look for Champ. That night, not far from their boat, they caught about 20 to 30 seconds of humps gliding on the water. Sandy described seeing a neck and head come up and look at her before sinking into the water. However, one expert looked at their footage believes that they only caught a school of fish. 
Now, Champ has also been featured on Destination Truth, Monster Quest, and Sightings. Oh, Sightings. That show yeah. doesn't get brought up a lot. <laughs> By one Michael Brown. Well, for good reason. It's a good show. Um, but anyway, uh, this is a good segment. Probably my favorite out of the Sea Monster segments of the show. Even more than Loch Ness. Uh, they actually had some pretty uh, good practical effects on of Champ. Showing the creature show up out of the water in the reenactment. All right, up next we're going to talk about a non-Unsolved Mysteries segment. Well, it's not a segment, but it's a mystery. And it's called the Mahenjo Daro, or the Mound of the Dead, as some people would call it. Well, that's what it's actually translated into. This actually doesn't have an official name. Um, it's just called the Mound of the Dead. Uh, this is an archaeological site in the province of Sindh, Pakistan, built around 2500 BCE. It was one of the largest settlements of the ancient Indus Valley civilization, one of the world's er earliest major urban settlements, contemporaneous with the civilizations of ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, Mayon and Crete, and um, Norte Chico. Um, Mahenjo Dara was abandoned in the 19th century BCE as the Indus Valley civilization declined and the site was not rediscovered until the 1920s. Significant excavation has since been conducted at the site of the city, which was designed, uh, which was designated as an uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1980. The site is currently threatened by erosion and improper restoration. Now, there's a few things that's cool about this um, this location and this story, which was uh, brought up to me by one of our listeners, um, it had a very sophisticated uh, sewage system. Like the um, the houses actually had kind of like toilet esque structures in there that went down into this kind of sewer that um, ran through the houses or whatever, and uh, underneath the roads, I believe they had roads. Um, they had something known as uh, the Great Bath which was like a big area where I guess people would bathe. Um, you know, when they uncovered it, they found artifacts and they found treasures and, you know, this, that, and the other. But kind of the biggest, I guess, thing about this city, the Mount of the Dead, is that there's an aspect to it that is somewhat mysterious. And that is... Well, what happened to these people? You know, because anytime you find one of these cities that's, that's you know, rediscovered or whatever, you'll usually find skeletal remains, but it won't be that big of a deal. But in this case, one of the main theories here is as to why these people, why this city failed was that um, there was perhaps a violent massacre, flood and disease. Um, but those have kind of been like the violent massacre, that's kind of been you know, not really believed so much because they, yes, they did find a bunch of bodies and skeletons and stuff, but they didn't find weapons. They didn't find like, you know, abrasions to the bones or anything like that. Now, this is a theory that I'm personally interested in that I'll just quickly go over and you can, uh, you know, take it for base value or you can wait for it, wait for it. Or you can be a skeptic and not believe it. Uh, I'll leave that up to you, but this uh, sounds pretty interesting. Something you can look into. One of the theories as to why this civilization got wiped out is evidence of atomic war. There exists a growing number of alternative archaeologists, which again, I'm sorry, it sounds like it might be BS, but that's up to you, uh, and researchers who have not settled for theories that do not satisfactorily explain the conditions of the skeletal remains and who have sought other explanations. One such individual is David Davenport, British Indian researcher, who spent 12 years studying ancient Hindu scripts and evidence at the site where the great city once stood. In his book, Atomic Destruction in 2000 BC, now think about that, Atomic Destruction in 2000 BC. Now, we didn't have atomic destruction until AD with uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. Now, this is some, like, crazy stuff if this, was, if this is actually substantiated. He reveals some startling findings. 
The objects found at the site appear to be fused, glassified, by a heat as high as 1,500 degrees Celsius, followed by a sudden cooling. Within the city itself, there appeared to be an epicenter about 50 yards wide, within which everything was crystallized, fused, or melted. And 60 yards from the center, the bricks are melted on one side, indicating a blast. Gorbovsky, in his book Riddles of Ancient History, reported that the discovery of at least one human skeleton in the area with a level of radioactivity approximately 50 times greater than it should have been due to natural radiation. Davenport claimed that what he found at the Mahanjo Daro corresponded exactly to what was seen at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, now, melted brick, you know, that's just, that blows my mind. So, Davenport theory was met with intense interest from the scientific community. Nationally known expert William Sturm said, quote, the melting of bricks at Menhenjo Daro could not have been caused by a normal fire, end quote. While Professor Antonio Castellani, a space engineer in Rome, said, it is possible that what happened at Menhenjo Daro was not a natural phenomenon. Since there is no indication of volcanic eruption at Menhenjo Daro, how many times are they going to keep making me say this word out loud and mispronounce it? Uh, one answer that has been put toward has been put forward is that the ancient city might have been irradiated by an atomic blast. If true, it would be impossible to ignore the conclusion that ancient civilization um, possessed higher technology. If Mahanjo Dara was, uh, was destroyed by a nuclear catastrophe, who created the weapons and how? Uh, if not, then what was it that produced enough heat to vitrify rock and bricks? What could explain the high degree of radioactive traces in the skeletons? How did all of them die in one instant? We believe it is time to stop accepting the sanitized view of the world, world provided to us by mainstream science and begin digging a little deeper. I have a theory. Sure. Aliens. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, sure are. Right. Now, the guy who sent me this, I don't know what sources he's going off of, but he was suggesting that, well, he was saying, I guess, one of the things being suggested, I don't want to put words in this guy's mouth, but he was saying something to the extent of there was a battle of, like, the gods in that area of good and evil, and that's kind of what created this black... You know, of course, it's... it's I mean, that, you know. I mean that's a possibility. Um, uh, my theory is just a theory, but aliens is just about as plausible as that. There could have been something where these ancient civilizations, they got a hold of alien technology... It backfired, and that's the result. I mean, to be pretty clear, like, all the crazy, like, ancient alien stuff you see on the History Channel, I think most of that's bullshit. But one thing I can agree on is I do believe that alien beings did land on Earth back in ancient Egypt kind of times, back in the B.C. times, B.C., whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, funny little side note here. It, in my Christian school, everything was known as B.C., before Christ. But I heard in the public schools it was B.C.E., before a common era. Um, yeah. Which, that's kind of a funny little side note. Depends on what you believe in there. Um, I believe that aliens came down and affected the development of our of our civilizations. In so, like Stargate. <laughs> Not familiar. Oh, you're you're not familiar with Stargate. You've never never heard of Stargate or or seen the movie Stargate. Mm, vaguely familiar. Maybe I have seen it. I don't know. But Kurt, I, Kurt Russell is in it. Uh, James Spader. Kurt Russell fucks up this Egyptian guy and says this badass one liner. Give my regards to King Tut, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, but I do believe uh, I do believe uh, aliens came down to our ancient civilization and affected our technology. Um, I just there's just too many there's just too many things I, that that maybe I'm not gonna go you know go ho on that and be like that's exactly what I believe. But that's I pretty much what you. I do believe. I mean, I, and I really uh, definitely do you know. Now, I'm not I, gonna... I, I don't know if I'd say I agree to disagree. I do think that that's a plausible thing that might have happened. I, I do believe that we have advanced our technology way faster than I think 
would be possible if there wasn't some sort of uh, other influence. I mean, just look at from the 50s to just 30 or 40 years later. Um, it, it just seems like something happened. And I, I, I tend to believe there might have been something that occurred concurrently with uh, the Roswell crash. Would it be go? Would it be going too far to say that I believe Asian people are a hybrid of alien, our ancestry of alien and humanoid? Um, uh, yeah. Well, think about it for a second. Asian people have very similar um, features. Are you, as, are, you, are you really going there? <laughs> I'm just saying they have similar features to to what is considered a gray. The the almond shaped eyes. The, the the sunken yeah, in face yeah, 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 but they tend to be more advanced Asian <laughs> people they tend to be more hairless as a gray would be I'm just saying what if a long time ago they they landed in, in the Asian area and breeded with the humanoids there the, the mammal kind of you know whatever and in, and over time what we have and you know because dude the Asians are fucking advanced you know what I mean? It's like, start, starting to sound like a crackpot. I, I know, English. I know, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> this is a, this is a safe spot where I can throw these theories out. This is something I've always thought about. Like I, I kind of think that Asians might be, <laughs> might they might have ancestry from oh, from well, aliens. Th there, there goes our Asian fan base. I don't know if they would be offended by that or not. I, I, I didn't say anything uh, hateful there. I'm just just saying, like it, it seems. I don't know. It just seems like something this little nib nibble and some nibble on that besides i don't think any asian people listen to this podcast now that might be offensive i don't know i don't know what's offensive what's not i'm, I, I'm not with this guy i'm in dangerous territory this, right I, now I, I don't know what this guy is talking <laughs> somebody about somebody help me out here um the asians being aliens really i don't know <laughs> i mean you know I, I these are the things i think about when the power goes off at 3 8, p.m. Uh, during the afternoon in my house sometimes. That's quoting a George Carlin, uh, obscure George Carlin bit there. Um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, how did the radiation blast happen? Uh, I don't know. Kind of the same thing with the Dilatov Pass or whatever. It, it was one of those... Uh, I love that kind of stuff. I really do. I yeah. love those stories. Um, whether it's aliens or not, I, I love that those stories. I love mis mystery. I love unsolved mysteries. If only there was a show that talked about all that stuff. Oh wait, yeah, there is. Um, we're we talk about it on a podcast. Um, but no, I I really do. I love that those those kind of stories uh, so much. That's why I've got to get into that show sightings that you keep talking about because they seem to solely focus on the stuff that I'm interested in. Yes, they do. Not saying that I don't love murders. I do love. I love murders. Okay, I love murders. I love abductions. <laughs> I love missing persons. Oh don't, my God, don't get that's... me wrong, but I gotta say the mysteries, the paranormal. That's where that really. Well, yeah, that that's that's always uh, what grabbed my attention too at a young age is the paranormal aspects of of the show and other things like that. But I've grown to really appreciate the other uh, stuff, like the murders, the the missing persons, the fraud cases, and and so on. I wouldn't say I love the murders. Uh, that's not really. Well, you know what I mean. I, I, I know. I, I wouldn't Man, use Mike, that. you are really painting me, and it's not any of my actions. You are really, you are doing everything to paint me as a bad person. Oh, you, you've done that before to me. So we're just. Yeah, that's we're, I'm, I'm, I'm just messing around. Just joshing me. Is that what you're saying? No, I said messing around. I'm not gonna. I'm not, I know you don't like that. So. Yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't do anything for me one or the other. All right, so it looks like it's time to go. Oh, one thing I wanted to tag on the Lake Champlain bit. I got I to gotta mention this. It's so funny. Okay, so this the Lake Champlain segment or whatever. Uh, at the very end, because you know at the very end when Robert Stack always kind of like recaps, you know? Yeah. So at the very end, it, it I swear to God, it looked to me as as though they, they cross-faded into Robert Stack a little too soon, like before he was ready. And he is like walking towards the camera and he is giving the biggest this is bullshit smirk on his face that I think I've seen. <laughs> like he is just like You need a screen cap. I, I will. Like I will. I'm gonna make a, a fucking note of that right now to screen cap that. But it, it is so funny because he is just like this is such bullshit. And then he's like, then he goes into what he has to say. And it's like, <laughs> man, Rob, give me a high five. Like I, you are you are the man. Oh, I love you. Great. So um, it, it's 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 he thinks this bullshit like the Amazon Woman in the Moon segment bullshit or not <laughs> was the Loch Ness monster also 
Jack the Ripper? Find out. I'm bullshit. Or not. <laughs> yeah, it's like the similar thing to like the nudist, uh, the segment of last podcast where he's like, you know, nudism is a blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he's got to be thinking to himself, like, how much are they paying me to do this again? You know, like, it's, it's just funny. Anyway, yeah. let's uh, let's get into the uh, fan Q and A here. Um, this is something that was uh, one of the f- other things that was requested, and it got like two or three likes. So four people want it. So hey, that's all it takes for me to want to do something and get behind it. Um, so we'll go back and forth here. Mike, do you want to do the first one? You want me to do the first one? You can do the first one. Okay, the first from is, first question is from. Uh, should we mention last names on here or no? I don't know. No, oh, fuck you. it. We'll mention last names. This podcast isn't that big. Uh, <laughs> this one comes from Sarah and a name I can't pronounce. So good, good on her. Se- Semen- Semenenye. Oh, God. Is she our, our only Asian listener that I just alienated? <laughs> Semenye. Uh, so her question is, how did you guys meet each other? Um, okay. That was a, that's a pretty easy one to answer. Um, I did a video about a ye- Well, I did a video about a year and a half, two years ago at this point, And it was... Um, uh, cause I had this YouTube channel I just started and I was thinking about ideas like, well, what, what can I do for a YouTube video? And I thought, oh man, I love unsolved mysteries. I have the, the ultimate chest, you know, collector addiction or whatever. Um, and then collector addiction, uh, addiction. Did that's I say addiction? To... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I meant to say my addiction. On but unsolved mysteries. Hey, th- that's actually a good uh, way to say it though. I mean, it's a collector addiction. <laughs> um, so anyway, Fucking, um, I, I had the collector edition, and then I had the, the Dennis Farina tapes, because I had VHS, I had recorded them on VHS tapes or whatever, because, like, I was so stoked that they were bringing Unsolved Mysteries back in 2008 that I was like, oh, I'm going to record every single one of these. Well, you know, come to find out that it, w- it was a total disaster, the revamps were shit. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to make a video, because I'm tired of saying I don't like something and then not having the answers to back up why I don't like it. So I'm going to put all my effort into making a video where I compare the old show and why it was great and then the new revamp and why it sucked ass so bad. And you can go and watch that video. It surprisingly hasn't been taken down yet at my channel, youtube.com slash Dancing With Ghosts. Anyway, uh, so a lot that was my first and really only super successful video. It's up to like 30,000 hits at this point. Mike stumbled across that video on Vimeo. Uh, why the hell he was on Vimeo, I don't know. And I didn't know anyone who even used uh, Vimeo. Um, he found it on there, and he watched it, and he liked it. And then he found me on YouTube, and he's... I don't remember exactly what you said, but it was... You liked the video a lot, and I think you were saying you liked the show too. And then you were mentioning something about, oh, I've been thinking about starting a podcast, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well private message me and i gave mike my uh well i said just yeah me what, I, what i did is i i i said you know i'm thinking about starting a podcast and since you like the show um i i was just basically saying asking josh whether he would be uh, up to collaborating with me and we didn't know each other yeah. from adam no 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 and uh so we exchanged information we set up a date and a time to communicate on skype and just chat for a bit. And now the podcast idea came to my mind because I had found uh, some links somewhere that had like a ton of old Unsolved Mystery segments. And I was just like in Unsolved Mysteries heaven euphoria for for a little bit. And I was just like, man, I love this show so much. I forgot. I was like, I forgot how much I love this show. And I was I, at first I was thinking about doing just a regular sort of thing. That I do on my channel where I just sit in front of the webcam and talk about whatever. But then I was like, you know, I saw that video and I think I was just searching for Unsolved Mystery stuff and I found a link to it, to your video on Vimeo. Yeah, and, and, you know, we, so, we, we had that first conversation and we like, you yeah. know, we're both chatty fucks and we hit it off pretty good. So it was like, yeah. oh, this will probably work. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, you, the longtime listeners, you've heard the many iterations that this podcast has been through from the really crappy uh, sound quality at the beginning and, you know, us trying out the very first episode and trying to do the uh, put the YouTube. Uh, we at the, in the early days, we actually would put up we'd film ourselves um, and we would put up uh, the video like so you could see us yeah. talk about these segments uh 
on, on video, you see our faces and everything. Such a pain in the ass, though. Yeah, it was a pain in the ass for not only us to do, but it didn't get any views. And then so Mike started uploading just the audio portion, and those got more views than anything else, probably because he used the Unsolved Mysteries thumbnail. But yeah, so that's how we met. So you can go ahead and take the next one there. Both of your, your uh, both of you. Uh, this is from Thomas Hatfield, our moderator. Uh, our, our, our he our says uh, both of you name your top three unsolved c cases that should have been aired as segments on UM. I don't know if I have top three, but I would have liked to have seen them cover, see their perspective on the Heartland Ghost case that was was used and featured quite frequently on sightings. To see if whether or not they would, you know, be like, this is bullshit, and then try to uncover it as a hoax, or actually uh, look at it as if it was a serious uh, case of, of ghostly uh, events. Uh, that case has always stuck with me, because I remember seeing it when I was a kid on Sci-Fi Channel. And also, it, it actually is one of those cases that actually talks about an entity that actually does physically harm people. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any more? Uh, on not, that case? Oh well, no! Like ones that should have aired. It's kind of hard um, to think of it off the top. It's of my it's, head. it's hard for the, me to think of it off the top of my head. Like that's the only one I can think of uh, because there's unsolved mysteries covered pretty much almost everything under the sun <laughs> during um, their run. I would have liked for them to have done a strange legend on the uh, JFK assassination. Um, oh, okay. They did. Yeah, that's. They did every other angle except for that. Maybe they felt like it was too obvious and it had been done ad nauseum. But I, I felt like Unsolved Mysteries brought uh, such a higher uh, scale to the even ones that segments have already been done a lot. Uh, like the JFK assassination, I, I would have really liked for them to have done a Strange Legends on the JFK assassination. Yeah, I think that would have been cool. It would have been cool to see them cover the Dilatov Pass as well. Yeah, yeah, Di Dilatov Pass would have been really cool. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, off the top of my head, is there any murders or anything like that I would have liked to have heard about? Um, shit, they covered Kurt Cobain. I mean, that, that would have been one if they hadn't already done it. Um, I, you know, some maybe some of the older rockers, like, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Jimi Hendrix, that his death, that would have been cool. Although I don't think there was anything mysterious about that. I mean, it's pretty no. cut and dry. Uh, shit, that's, that's a good question, Thomas. But, like, off the top of our heads, it's really hard to, um, you know, come up with something. And he's got another question here. Uh, has watching Unsolved Mysteries changed the way you interact with people? Are you less trusting? Do you have certain ways that you approach situations to avoid danger and harm? Um, I think, as a whole, uh, Unsolved Mysteries was a big piece of the puzzle in my childhood development as far as my fear and paranoia. Um, and I know that that sounds like a bad thing, and it probably is, but... Uh, as, as a kid, it definitely did, and, you know, as you're a kid, like, these things that happen to you are building blocks to who you'll become as an adult. So I would say, yeah, it, it did change the way I interacted uh, with people at first. Um, I was very paranoid of people's intentions and stuff. And see, that's that's a problem, though, with, with media, is that it puts these biases in your mind that may or may not even be true. Um, once I actually got out into the real world myself, I realized that not everybody is this malicious killer who has ill intentions. So I'd say that it did do that for the negative. It did, it did affect me in that way. And, um, you have, that's why it's best to watch shows like this as an adult. So you can kind of process it more properly. As a kid, I just took it as law. Like, oh, everybody's like that, you know, but I don't regret a second of watching it. What about you, Mike? Well, I don't think it really changed the way I interact with people at all, really. Um, I have always, I was always somebody who was afraid and freaked out when I was a kid. I mean, I was so scared of things and my surroundings when I was young that I was afraid of even walking off the curb. So um, it didn't take. It was. It wasn't until later in my life when I was actually cognizant enough to really be able to understand how to interact with people interact with people properly anyway um let alone learn to trust people uh so I, I i guess i could say it was already kind of leery of things 
before I even saw the show. And so it didn't really change much in that regard. Um, it didn't really make me approach certain situations differently either. So, um, yeah, I mean, it didn't really change me that much. All right, you get the uh, you grab the next question. Uh, Emma Johnston asks, uh, "What other shows have grabbed your attention, like UM has, or podcasts for that matter?" That's a good question, and uh, if you've been following the podcast for a while, you know one of the uh, shows that I will mention, and of course that is Sightings, which I saw a good amount of times when I was young, along with Unsolved Mysteries. I highly recommend it. I know I've done that a b bunch of times. But I really do mean it, and if you like the unexplained and uh, paranormal segments on Unsolved Mysteries, definitely give Sightings a watch. It's on YouTube. There's a channel called Paranormal Mysteries, which has every single, pretty much every single episode of the show on there. Uh, not every episode, but pretty much. There's like a few missing episodes. Um, all right. Well, for me, um, and I, there were a few others too, like uh, Rescue 911. That was another one that yeah. grabbed my attention. Yeah. Bill Shatner, yeah. And uh, America's Most Wanted. I'd say from uh, what about podcasts or any podcasts you listen to? Not really. I don't really listen to podcasts. <laughs> for me, uh, shows have grabbed my attention like Unsolved Mysteries has. Um, well, since you didn't specify a genre, um, I would say the uh, the shows that I keep coming back to um, would be Curb Your Enthusiasm on HBO with Larry David. Um, it's one of my favorite shows. Uh, Seinfeld's one of my favorite shows. The first uh, ten seasons of The Simpsons are great. Um, everything after that is garbage. Beavis and Butthead, uh, obviously. Uh, it's pretty obvious that that's one of my favorite shows. Um, oh, shit. Uh, Family Guy, the especially like the first, like I don't know, 13, 14 I, seasons. I, yeah, maybe the first few seasons for me with that show. I, I don't know. Like, especially lately, it's really, really fallen. I mean, as far as, like, stuff that I really... I mean, like, honestly, though, Unsolved Mysteries is my favorite TV show. Uh, I can't really think of one that comes close to stimulating me mentally as much. I, I mean, Sightings is close for me, but also so is something like Tales from the Crypt. I love that show. That, that's probably my favorite show. That one, what channel did that time. come on back in the day? Because I don't... HBO. Yeah, it was on see, HBO originally, that's... and then it aired on EMC in, in versions that were edited for television. Yeah, that's why That's why I might have said that one, but... Uh, oh, um, actually... Are You Afraid of the Dark on Nickelodeon was a really good show that I liked a lot. Um, that that was kind of in the spooky. If you like that show a lot, then definitely revisit Tales from the Crypt, like, as soon as possible. Okay. Trust me. I mean, it is, it, you know, the first, the seventh season, the last one is the weakest season. They cut the budget and moved to England. Um, but there are some segments, there are some episodes on there that are that are all right. But really, the first six seasons are the strongest ones. I'd probably say the first four are the strongest. And then it, then there's kind of differences in quality with five and six. But it's not that bad. There's There are definitely some gems in each of those seasons. As far as podcasts I listen to, I listen to the uh, CU podcast, otherwise known as a completely unnecessary podcast with Pat Contry and Ian Ferguson. That's a video game podcast. I'm really big into video games, so I find that very interesting. Uh, I have listened to Bill Burr's Monday Morning Podcast for the past 10 years. Uh, I stopped for a few years because he just would go off on sports for really long ta tangents, and I just stopped listening. Uh, recently started listening again, and he's I, I, I like it again. You know that, that happens sometimes. I'll take breaks from stuff, and I'll come back. I used to listen to Mark Maron's WTF podcast, but then I got bored with the guests that he kept bringing on because I didn't know yeah. who they were. Um and actually, uh, XM had a, uh, the radio station XM, which has now become Sirius XM, they actually had a, a podcast called Stand Up Sit Down, where they would um, sit down with stand up comedians and they would interview them. That was a great podcast. I still have it downloaded to my hard drive, but it, you can't find it anymore. I mean, they interviewed Carlin, they interviewed um, 
God, they interviewed all the, a lot of the great comedians. Um, some, some, some of them, it was their last interview they did before they died, like Carlin. I mean, it might not have been his last one, but it was very in-depth, really good. Um, yeah, that was pretty much it for, for that. Uh, the next question we have Yeah, is, we don't really listen to true crime podcasts. No, that's one thing. Yeah, we don't. We don't listen to, like, you know, uh, the Thinking Sideways, Generation Y, Up and Vanished, Vanished, all those ones. I'm they're, I'm sure they're great podcasts. We just, neither one of us are fans of that genre. The Trail That Went Cold. Last podcast on the left, giving shout outs to a bunch of other people here. I'm sure you guys already listen to all those anyway. But, I mean, I would love to collaborate with any of those people. I think that'd be fun cross pollinate our audiences i'd love to so if any of you guys can suggest that that would probably help our cause we're already we're already working with some of the podcasts i won't mention who they are maybe for an anniversary special um but yeah i mean that'd be cool um anyway next question from ASCII mcquestion face thomas hatfield <laughs> here who has like three questions in so far um were there any segments you found the protagonist slash victim annoying? That's a good question. Well, uh, 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 what about Mr. Uh, Moon Pie Face? <laughs> I wasn't sure if the if their polygraph could compensate for the medication that I was on at the time, so I didn't think it was a wise decision for me to participate in that. My face is very large and white, much like a moon pie. Yeah, Mike Morris was not the <laughs> victim uh, protagonist or anything, but God, I did not like that guy. Um, <laughs> God, I don't else? really. I can't. I can't think of anyone for me personally. Well, I mean, no. There, there was that guy who was. I'm trying to remember what episode that was. It was the guy who was. I mean, the, there are some where, like, the couple that kidnapped that other that woman and the other. We covered that recently, and they were interviewed, and they were clearly guilty, and they were being all, you know, asses about things. So whenever oh. that kind of thing happens on the show, when you have somebody who's clearly guilty to me that is just being an asshole, or or there's other people who are who are like incredulous, like the guy who's all like the, who made the Michael Jordan reference in one of the segments. I don't remember that one. No, that was pretty funny. Um, all the people that annoy me are people who I know are guilty. Like one Frank Rizzo comes yeah. to mind with the backyard bones segment. Uh, Monica Rizzo turned up missing, and Frank Rizzo. I don't. God, how I keep forgetting that case. We got to cover that one. That was from the Ultimate Collection. Even um, I didn't really like Diane Lubinek from the Canadian UFO segment because uh, at first I thought she was just an innocent farm girl. But then, like, the more kind of we dug into that segment, the more we realized that she probably staged the whole thing or she had some hand in that because she acted like... Because, you know, this was all anecdotal evidence. You know, this was all just going off of her stories and all. Yeah. And she was claiming she didn't know anything about UFOs or anything like that. But then they were saying when Unsolved Mysteries filmed in her house, they saw a bunch of books and stuff on UFOs in her basement. So And they seemed like they were kind of tucked away. So... Uh, she kind of got on my nerves. Um, but I can't really think of it. I mean, when the victims. I'd say a lot of the a lot of the skeptics are annoying. Yeah, but those aren't victims necessarily. That's kind of a hard one. I would say no because like the victims, I te I tend to actually feel bad for them because yeah. if we're talking victim, we're talking like mur someone they love yeah. was murdered or something like that. But if we're talking about a protagonist, I mean, there are some. It's you know, there's like the some of the miracle ones are pretty annoying. Yeah, yeah, the miracle ones. Uh, yes, a lot of the psychics are very annoying. Um, uh, that's the, their names are uh, James von Prague is a pretty annoying bastard. Um, the Valley, the the one we covered on a bonus segment, the miracle one, the Valley Hill, whatever. Oh miracle yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> those are all really annoying fucks. All those little kids and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those little kids are annoying little fucks. <laughs> all right, Mike, you get the next one. This is from Jason Vanden Heuvel. Uh, hey guys, long time listener, first time caller. Uh, my wife, yeah, I love that. <laughs> my wife Samantha and I have a joint question with all the true crime mystery shows that have aired throughout the years and even today. What is it about UM that inspired you guys to dedicate so much time to the show? 
Um, it's a big part of my childhood. There's a lot of nostalgia that's involved. I think that's a big part of it as well. Um, and also just it's such a great show. I mean, it was one of the first of its kind. In fact, it was the first of its kind. Uh, there were some specials called Missing that were aired on TV before this, but this was the first show on primetime on a network that really focused on this kind of thing. Uh, shows like Forensic Files and all this other stuff that's happened afterwards honestly has a lot to owe to Unsolved Mysteries. So um, it inspired me to dedicate so much time to the show because I love it so much. And it is my way of giving back and showing appreciation for the show that meant so much to me. I'd say for me, um, nostalgia does play into it a little bit. Just a little bit. Um, most of it comes from the intangibles of the show Unsolved Mysteries. There's just certain intangible things about the show that you can't put your finger on the the nuance the subtlety it's just yeah. the right amount of everything that me personally i look for in 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 a show or in a documentary uh a lot of the cameramen came from documentary style um shooting we learned that from talking to kevin o'brien and so it had the documentary feel which i love documentaries those are some of my favorite things to watch with documentaries it had a very there was realism to it that and even in the reenactments and and it just felt like they were taking it seriously even when they had things that were like goofy and silly at least they were taking it seriously yes um obviously robert stack um is a phenomenal host and a phenomenal narrator anything he narrates uh, it, it's it just in the same way that you love hearing a great singer sing a, a song and, and that singer could sing anything and you'd still like it because of their voice. It's the same thing with Robert Sack. He could narrate anything and it's more interesting to me. Although um, sometimes there are some things that like that, uh, like the aphrodisiacs episode like yeah, even he, he could save even, that not even robert stack could save that one but yeah it's a different <laughs> story <laughs> and that's another segment where i found the protagonist annoying is yeah that one. um and then the music you know the music um i found and i actually i think me and thomas had this conversation on messenger or whatever i found that i love that music so much that's on unsolved mysteries if i hear stuff that sounds similar to it like uh, like Genesis, some of their stuff has they that that old synthesizer, that old keyboard sound. I find I like that music just because it reminds me of the music from Unsolved Mysteries. The music was so fantastic. Yeah, and, I mean, and not just the main theme. I mean, there's there's the other bits of music that they used for the show that were equally as great. Yeah, there's and, like fifty different pieces of music that make. Uh, up I would show. love to to buy an MP. I would love to see an MP3 album of the music. Yes. And, uh, and I would definitely buy it. For sure. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, in, in short, that's, that's that, uh, you, oh, Mike, you can, or I guess I'll get the next one cause you just did the other one, even though this is your homeboy. Um, <laughs> so Mike Martin asks, uh, oh crap. I hope I'm not too late. No, you're not. And that's his question. I'm just joking. Um, what UFO segment would you guys like to see turned into a movie? Um, uh, for me, well, Mike, you go first. Allagash. I was going to say Allagash, but then I, I really had to think about, like, okay, yes, that is my favorite UFO segment, but would that make the best movie? I think it would. It would be a lot like Fire in the Sky, but even more, possibly even more intense. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I feel Because Fire in the Sky only focused on one person who got abducted. The other people didn't really... Well, maybe they did, but they didn't really... It focused more on uh, D.B. Sweeney's character with the stuff on the ship. The other one that comes to mind for me would be the Missing Time segment. Yeah, that's another one that popped in my head, too. I mean, that's another something potentially you could do a Missing Time movie. It's just so hard to do, uh, I think... I, I If they did a UFO movie, I'd want it to be... I'd want it to be, like, found, almost like found footage style. Uh I don't. I don't. Wouldn't want to do that. Uh, because I mean, if you make been, it too been, cinematic and epic, it's just going to be like another. That's that's been overdone. I think we could use another Fire in the Sky type movie. To be honest, yeah. I think Al Gash would be a great pick for that. Yeah, that's probably the best one. I was gonna. Th I was thinking Roswell, but I'm sure there are already movies about the Roswell incident. 
anything coming to mind there on that mic? Not really. Really? Huh. Well, then maybe... Uh... I mean, there's a TV show called Roswell, but I don't think it has anything to do with the Roswell. Loosely has something to do with the Roswell incident. Uh, there's... I believe there's been some movies that have been inspired by it, like Hangar 18 or Intruders, but... All right, uh, next question, Mike. That's for you. This is the last question. This is from Zachary Weber. And don't worry, you know, if you if we missed your question it's or if you weren't able to get in. Question. Oh, it's not? Well, I can't... Well, I guess somebody put another question on there. <laughs> the time it's, that... it's on the other page. Oh, okay. All right. Um, but it's the last question on our, our uh, private group uh, by Zachary Weber. He says, would you do commentaries of Amazon episodes? I don't know. Like, what would we really add to it? I mean, I think that would be fun, honestly, especially yeah. if we did it on, like, a live stream thing. But Yeah, I mean, I'd be up for doing it on a live stream, but... The only problem that I think that we would run into would be legal. If, if we... if we, not if we put that we just don't even put play the audio or anything and then you know we have our headphones on and we just do the live stream with the commentary that way i feel like it's something that could possibly be done in the future yeah as long as we don't play any audio from the show or whatever we should be fine well if it's like a live stream meaning that it only air it only airs at one time and you got to be there and present to like witness us doing it and then it's gone i think that's fine right yeah, maybe, but I would honestly prefer to just watch it with my headphones anyway. But then people wouldn't even hear the audio. They'd just hear us remarking on things. I mean, what Yeah, I know. But if they have Amazon, they can go in and watch the segment along with us. All right, guys, hit play at the same time. Here we go. Three, two, one, hit play now. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. um, all right, our next question... Um, is from Amanda Huckins. She messaged me this on my Facebook page. She goes, um, has, uh, shit. Has someone already asked if you guys have experienced anything of the paranormal? So have, uh, have we ever experienced anything paranormal? I think that might have been one of the things that somebody asked in the Q&A a while back. Because I do remember talking about, or maybe I just mentioned it myself. I not, I mean, I, I don't know if this is specifically paranormal or not, but I do remember when I was staying over at my dad's place in Oklahoma City, and my uncle Tony was living there with a uh, with me, who was on, a, who was bipolar and, and extremely scary to be around. And there was this all this, there was this kind of weird vibe around the house anyway at the time anyway. So, I do remember one night, I was sleeping on the couch, and I have this feeling as if something is looking at me, and this, like, sense of dread. I wake up, and I, I, swear, I swear I saw, like, some kind of shadowy figure or something. And then I, I definitely did not go back to bed. I could not sleep for the rest of the night. Um, and my dad and my stepmom said they also saw something like that as well so they ended up actually getting a priest over there and we had somebody who a pastor who ended up blessing the house oh wow so um for me in short no uh i mean i've heard other people's stories about paranormal stuff but no i've never nothing paranormal has ever happened to me um i can't even fake it and lie and be like yeah totally and it's like no i mean if i'm being honest no and I'm kind of glad of that. And then, for God's sakes, our final question, because I actually have to go soon, uh, is from David James Donnelly, and he asked this on our Unco Uncovering Unexplained Mysteries uh, actual fan page or whatever, which shows you just how little uh, people interact with that anymore, given this group, because only, you know... I know, I know David. He's a friend of mine, so... Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question, David. So he asks, the first question is, do you guys uh, like the show Fear Thy Neighbor? Uh, I love that show. I think that's one of the best shows on uh, Investigation Discovery. I think I might have seen that once, so I don't know what I can say about it. It's a great show. It's it's one of the better shows on that whole uh, network, I would say. So yes, I'm a huge fan of that show. 
Uh, his second question was uh, thoughts on the deep web and have you guys ever been on there? I don't. Oh, the deep web. Okay, well, I've seen the documentary on the deep web, which if you haven't seen it yet, David, I do recommend it. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was called again, but uh, you just search up deep web documentary. You should be able to find it. Um, it was directed by uh, Bill from Bill and Ted oh, himself, nice. Alex Winters. Um, the deep web, I, I do think that some of it is just bullshit. Some of the some of the uh, rumors are surrounding it and what whatever. Even the deep web is like the dark web. It's a place where you can only access with the Tor browser. It, it, you've heard about it. It's like the place where it's not dot com or dot net. It's these other places, and um, there's some crazy weird shit on the deep web. So you can buy drugs on the deep web, or you can. Uh, find some pretty fucked up videos on the deep web of, you know, people dying and so on. Snuff films? Now, that's a rumor that they're, you know, real snuff films, but, I mean, they're, they're, some of them actually do exist, but a lot of them aren't technically snuff films, but, you know, kind of like just death footage type deal. I've never been on the deep web. I never plan to go on the deep web because I don't want the FBI, you know, watching my ass. I don't want to be on the watch list. You don't want to be banned. All right. Uh, yeah, that's that sounds really fascinating. Um, so uh, his third question is favorite old school unsolved mysteries episode. Uh, old school. There's too many. Yeah, uh, I cannot. I cannot name just one. Yeah, it's too many. And his last question is: Have you guys ever seen a ghost? We already answered that. Uh, that would be a no from uh, that. Uh, I don't think so, Tim. I, I don't know if it's a ghost or not, but what I saw was definitely pretty freaky. Maybe maybe it was some kind of uh, demonic presence. Maybe it wasn't a ghost. Maybe it was something else. But yeah. All right, so you guys can all relax. It's the end of the Q&A. It's uh, pretty much the end of the podcast. Just a few things. It's a pretty long one. I yeah. uh, hope you guys enjoyed it, though. Um, I definitely got to head out because my stomach is giving me the signal of feed me yeah, or I'm going to keep making you miserable. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Well, I just want to mention a few things real quick. Um, if you want to subscribe to it or, uh, donate to us on uh, Patreon, it's patreon.com slash uncovering unexplained mysteries. You get the podcast uh, a day early and there's some other perks we're working on there. Um, that, uh, you know, just go on there and you'll see the various benefit tiers and all that kind of stuff. Um, also, um, if you could go into iTunes and give us a review of the podcast, um, we, uh, I see that we got like two negative ones lately. Um, and I don't know. There's other ones that you can do as well. I mean, other, other places to rate. I think there's, uh, that not just on iTunes. I think there's other places you can post reviews and things like that. Yeah. But other, other sites just aggregate it from iTunes. So oh, okay. iTunes is the big daddy. So if you guys are listening out there, if you haven't put in a review for our podcast yet on iTunes, if you could, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, we definitely appreciate it. I mean, it helps get it. it out it's there. fine. If you don't like listen to the podcast and don't like it, but I mean, I think some people done some of these reviews, they don't honestly give us a chance. No, it's like they just go in and listen to the first few episodes. And like, oh, this is terrible. And I'm like, I admit, yeah, it is pretty bad from the, from the beginning. Uh, but we, we, you know, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, I just don't. I don't want to get too many negative reviews in there and have it go to like you know three stars and then two star. I mean, I don't think that's ever going to happen. We have a bunch of five star reviews in yeah. there, but eh, I don't know. I just figured I'd mention that. Um, and remember that, uh, John and Terry are doing the ask me anything on Reddit at 3 PM Eastern time. Uh, that's something I'm definitely going to try to jump on and be a part of and hopefully report back to you guys what they say as far as why you guys such jerks. Um, I don't know. Don't worry like that. I'm not, just, I'm not, I'm not. Just, I'm not. It would help to break the ice by asking something else first and then maybe going with that. Um, but, uh, and Mike's, yeah, Mike's, uh, YouTube channel is youtube.com slash OCP communications. If you want to check his content out, which you should. And that's all I got. Yeah. Let's do that. See ya.
since you people seem to like outtakes so much. Merry Christmas. Well, that, that's, all, dude, that's all horror movies nowadays. I know, that's the problem. They've forgotten how to make an actual horror film because they, they think in order to make a horror movie, they need to make it obviously scary. And um, they try too hard. And for me personally, that makes it less scary. Um, case in point, with the clown Pennywise, the way they have him look now, he looks he lo already looks creepy. Like his regular clown outfit. He looks like he's some uh, porcelain clown doll from the 1900s. Already looks creepy. So it defeats the whole purpose of the innocent clown who becomes evil. He already looks evil from the beginning. So what the fuck is the point? <laughs> Am I really supposed to believe that any kid is going to see this creepy looking, obviously like not even innocent bozo looking clown like Tim Curry, but this fucking sinister looking 1900s clown with a, you know, who just looks like he's a serial killer right from the get go. Am I supposed to believe any kid's going to see that and be like, oh yeah, what? Then we're gonna run away. I still say that for my money, the first Saw movie is the most original, unique horror movie that we've had in like in, in since like the two thousands. Yeah, maybe. I mean, there's a few other films that are that I think have been pretty, you know. But it's it's kind of hard though because horror lately is just yeah the genre as a whole has been kind of weak. It's kind of been so you it's all been done before, I think, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, but I just think you just put a new spin on an old idea would, you know, is kind of something they need to do more of instead of doing all these reboots and remakes and sequels. Uh, I'm guessing like the main two we're going to be focusing on is the Patricia Meehan and the um yeah, uh Lock or Champ or whatever. And then and then, and then we have the Q&A. The Q&A, so. yeah. So I So so the that. other one will just be briefly sort of on your your end just talk about it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um do you want to start out with uh Patricia Meehan and then go to Champ and then whatever yeah. you're gonna you're gonna have to kind of lead the i guess kind of both of these although i did take some notes on champ but they're not nearly as detailed as they would have been i just got sandra May now i mean it's it's all right i mean because i got i you know champ is pretty much uh, i know what i want to talk about i have i have the the uh unsolved more mysteries transcript here um there's a little bit on wikia but I I don't know. I might do Wikia instead of the other one, and then maybe like mention a few quotes from here or some people. Yeah, I got I got some stuff from the actual segment. I like to get as much from the segment as I can, um, just because it kind of like you know brings people the whole unsolved mysteries experience to a certain extent. Um, uh -huh. So I got some quotes from Santa Mancy, her recollection of seeing it and all that. Ooh, excuse me. <laughs> And then I have some more stuff from the show um, that I'll interject in there, I guess, whenever. Um, and, yeah, I just saw the Mat uh, Patricia Meehan one the other day, so, I mean, that one's pretty fresh in my memory. But, That's why I thought it'd be a good pick. Yeah. And people were uh, talking about it on the, on the podcast group anyway, yeah, so I was I, like... I didn't even mean for it to be that way. I just thought that was a really fun uh, scene, like, that they showed of her. And they, you know, they weren't even trying to be, like... To be oh. honest, I thought she was a really gorgeous woman. To be honest, I thought yeah, she, she was. was yeah, yeah, for sure, she was cute. I thought the uh, psycho killer lady that we covered a few ones back via parent, yeah. Elaine Parent. Uh -huh. I thought she was probably. Uh, she's she's been the hottest chick that I've come across on Unsolved thus far. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say, man? I like my girls a little psycho. Uh huh. All right, uh, that sounds pretty good then. Psycho killer. Run, 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 David Byrne. Any fucking hoozles. All right. Giant suits. No, that was that was actually a great. I would almost call it like a movie, but it wasn't. The uh, Stop Making Sense. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that live concert DVD? No, I've, I've heard of it, though. I've seen oh, clips. Oh, yeah, it's really good. If you're even the slightest fan of Talking Heads. I'm not even that big of a fan of Talking Heads. It's just a, kind of a cinematic 
Thing. I did a music video a long time ago. I like to re-edit it. I like to do it again of uh, Halloween with uh, Psycho Killer. Oh, cool. All right, let's get into this. All right. Oh, shit, what episode is this? Is this 40? I think this it's is 40. 40. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to say it's 40. <laughs> don't pick up smoking kids Ah. Uh. i actually have the quote from this part from the show if if i could just read that can if you if you wish to (laughs) i do wish to yeah because uh this is from the actual segment because they they interviewed her or whatever and i i i I typed her quote down here we're good so so yeah. Oh, that's an edit right there. <laughs> Forty nine oh three. First edit of the podcast. Take a shot. Hey, if it's just one. Yeah, that would be great for me. Because <laughs> there were like four or five there last were five time. Five last time, yeah, and they were all for me, I think. So uh, anyway. Oh, shit. Yeah, do a <laughs> take three on that. <laughs> so um. This, um, yeah. So I thought that was a good one, interesting one. And there we go. You know, we also gave you guys a little info on some animals and insects and other creatures that are in danger that people thought were extinct. So since we already did an edit, might as well do another one. I gotta take a piss. Alrighty. Alrighty then. Six, 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 the number of the beast. When you were mentioning uh, the uh, Beavis and you were doing the Beavis and Butthead thing, like, do you remember the Grim Reaper music video they made fun of? I the, do. the fat guy. Yeah. That's actually a pretty good band. They made some good music, but I have to admit, yeah, that. The music video is pretty bad. I remember uh, Halloween was another one that uh, they made fun of. That was pr- dude. They their their riffing on music videos was fucking golden. Yeah, it is. I, I like the song. <laughs> See you in hell, my friend. See you in hell, my friend. I remember there was a scene. Oh, there was friend. there was like a. I'll see you in hell. Yeah, it goes really high, so I can't really hit that. There was like no. a, a, a the band Bush, I think. Or, uh, it was either Bush or I think. I don't know who the fuck. Bush, it was. Bush. I only remember their one song from American World from Paris well, called Mel. They had uh, they had a video or whatever it, on Beavis and Butthead, and they were like you know watching the video or whatever. And in the first part of the video, like there's a body bag being on, on a gurney being rolled down the hallway. And then they unzip the uh, the bag, and it shows Gavin Rossdale, and he starts singing. And Butthead goes, "Well, he thucks, zip him back up," <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was one of the funniest <laughs> lines. <laughs> There's another one, uh, Soundgarden, the video for uh, Spoon Man, uh-huh. where. Um, in the lyrics, um, uh, Chris Cornell goes, "All my friends are brown and red," and um, Beavis goes, uh, "Hey, butthead!" He says, "All his friends are brown and red." He goes, "Yeah, all his friends are turds." Yeah, <laughs> something like that. It's fucking hilarious. I can I can think of a few different ones. Um, I I, cry, I thought there uh, the new season they did. I wish there were more because I actually thought the 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 new season they did on MTV was actually pretty good. Uh, especially yeah, the stuff they were they were uh, riffing on the MTV reality shows because they they did the music videos too, but they also riffed on the reality shows, which I I, th- I thought was really funny. I knew I like, knew that the new Beavis and Butthead wasn't going to have legs because it's just it was it's just not culturally relevant anymore. Because they, they were they were uh, riffing on the the Jersey Shore and and the 
16 and pregnant and the the, the addicted one where the guy's addicted to porn. <laughs> Yeah, like like in the '90s, it was like this new kind of fresh thing. But uh, you know, kids are so dumb these days; they they can't appreciate you know witty satire. And then the, twi- the Twilight parody. Yeah, that was really funny. They to... They bit each other and they got sick and shit, and they thought they were becoming vampires. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, let's go back into this here. So yeah, you know that I th- I think that there's a possibility that um you know that could be out there. I'm not gonna poo poo that. It's a very, it's a very slim possibility though, because I I don't you haven't really heard that many sightings lately. Look, could have died, you know. Yeah, that's another possibility. So uh, moving on to a non unsolved mysteries topic. Uh, that would be the Mohanjo Daro, or the Mohanjo Daro, however you want to say that J. Sometimes J is pr- pronounced H, sometimes it's a Y, whatever. Um, or otherwise known as the Mound of the Dead. Now, this is a city that was, um, recent, well, not recently, but it was, it was found by archeo- archaeologic, God fucking damn it. <laughs> 5710. This is what happens when I do shit that's not Unsolved Mysteries related. I, I, I <laughs> fucking freeze up. Well, or from my lack of research on it. Um, let me see here. Damn it, now you got Scatman stuck in my head. Oh, it's a catchy <laughs> tune. <laughs> 